everybody. Welcome to this webinar on recurrent tracheal esophageal fistula. I think it's a very uh, challenging um, disease or complication if you have that. And we all know if you do that in and repair that in an open fashion, you lose esophageal length and it's all a mess because there has been abscesses and uh, anastomotic leakages usually. And uh, that's why uh, we are always looking for minimal invasive techniques. And uh, we have two speakers tonight who will speak about these um, minimal invasive uh, techniques, uh, which may be more elegant than what a lot of us do so far. So the first speaker um, of tonight is Dr. Manuel uh, Lopez. He is um, head of the Department of Pediatric Surgery and Urology at the University Hospitals of uh, Val de Bron, Barcelona. He has a degree in medicine from the Universidad Libre in Colombia. Um, and Manuel um, underwent postgraduate training in the areas of pediatric surgery and urology in Argentina, including a fellowship in France and Switzerland, all with a main focus on minimal invasive technique. Um, he is a frequent presenter including live surgical demonstrations at international conferences, an author of more than 65 scholarly article and book chapters, and his fact, uh, faculty at the IRCAT course, at the IPEC course, and founding member of ASPES. Um, besides that, he belongs to the executive committee of the Chest Wall International Group, and uh, Manuel Lopez is past president of the French group in pediatric endosurgery from 2009 to 2011. Besides that, uh, he's involved in humanitarian missions in Cambodia. So these would be enough reasons to invite him tonight and listen to uh, his stories. But another one is he um, had um, in 2016 a large series on chemocauterization to close recurrent tracheal esophageal fistula, a paper which was published in Surgical Endoscopy. And uh, that's why um, uh, we are happy to have him tonight. So Manuel, it's a privilege um, that I met you last uh, year in both Strasbourg and Athens. And um, we are very honored that you give uh, a talk tonight on your technique, how to handle recurrent tracheal esophageal fistula. The stage is all yours. Th thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. It's, it's too much. So good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Um, um, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, the organizing committee for your kind invitation from the website for this uh, opportunity to share with my friends, uh, Dario Patkowski, our experience in in the management on RTF and today I will share our experience in endoscopic management of RTF. So every note that the one of the most severe complications after primary repair of esophageal atresia is RTF that has been repaired between three and 50% in different series. So do you see my, my screen or Martin? Yes, no? Yes, we can see it perfectly. Okay. So the, the classic treatment involving the surgical approach performed by thoracotomy or by thoracoscopy, but however, it's, it's a real challenge, even in the more experienced surgeons, uh, even in, of course, in MIS. But everybody know that the high rate of the second RTF increased a little bit more that had been described more than 20% in different series and also the risk of the morbidity and mortality is, is higher. So this is one of, our, of the patient that had been performing a trachotomy with failure after RTEF. But however, another additional option that can be performed in this group of the patient is uh, the tracheal segmental reception and closure to the esophageal defects by transcervicotomy or by esternotomy, depending where it localized the fistula. Therefore, it seemed reasonable to propose an alternative treatment. And today I can to tell you that yes, it's, it's, uh, it's reasonable to propose an endoscopic procedure. 
So the first uh, report of the successful uh, was described in 1975 by a German surgeon who used the plastic adhesive for closing the RTF in, in pediatric uh, in patients. So after that, several uh, alternatives uh, through the esophagus or through the trachea had been described using the fibrin glue, sclerosis, T-cell cautotarization, collagen and argon, like in these cases, or laser. So this is, is one of our, the cases with esophageal pulmonary uh, fistula that is a very special type of acquired RTF. So in this case, uh, probably endoscopic by through the uh, through the trachea is not possible, but only uh, uh, flexible bronchoscopic had been used just to identify the, the location. But when you decide to perform on the endoscopic, probably the best way is the via esophagus. But look at it, you identify very well the fistula, but even in very good condition, like in this case, you have the good instrument that excellence endoscopy is, uh, so you can to, to, to perform on the, this kind of the procedure. But in this case, you think that the, 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 the technique is, is perfect. And in this case, an additional uh, technique had been, had been used uh, and placed uh, several clip in, in order to, to, to get more uh, success for, for the treatment. But however, uh, there are many reports in the literature who demonstrate the high rate of the failure that it was in this case. So this is a very interesting paper and was uh, our inspiration to introduce the, the use of the TCA in, in this group of the patient that was this report in 2008 by uh, Kim from Seoul. So this team described uh, report three patients with a history of the sopagolatresia, with uh, RTF, and in this case, they use or the use of the TCA uh, by endoscopy through the, through the trachea, and with 100% of the success. So TCA is, or is used in uh, sclerosis or uh, substance, is a strong acid. The small amount is not toxic, and it doesn't risk injury of the distal airway because the bronchial secretion neutralize the acid. So the process of the obliteration include the epithelialization who induce the soft tissue edema and to lead the fibrosis and finally provoke the auto obliteration. But this, this substance has been used for a long time ago in gynecology for sclerosis of the epithelial lesions in dermatology for, for the treatment of the acne and the, in cosmetology for the peeling or even in, in otorhinolaryngology has been used for uh, closing the uh, piriformis sinus. So let me to, to report what had been our experience that started when I was uh, in, in France in 2006 uh, with the use of the TCA that uh, Martin explained was a report in, in the surgical endoscopy. In all cases, the RTF was confined by clinical, by esophagogram, by endoscopy. This is one of our patients that look at this, uh, this is the fistula and the bronchogram during the esophagogram procedure was identified. And, and after that, we performed the endoscopy. This is a different tip and trick that we can to use in case you don't see very well the fistula. You can to use the, the tracheal tube through the esophagus in order to occlude the esophagus and to, to, to uh, introduce the silent distillation of air in order just to identify the, the, the localization of the fistula. But in, in the majority of our cases, sir, we don't need this kind of the trick so you see uh, perfectly uh, the fistula that you can see, you can see uh, the, the gastric tube, but the majority of our patients with RTF has been very, very large as fistula compared to the congenital uh, delay uh, uh, RTF. 
So even in this is a patient with a fistula with colon, in, in a patient with Easter with her, uh, esophageal transposition who underwent uh, colon transposition with her uh, fistula with colon. So in this kind of the procedures have been used or the, the TCA also. So this is the, the tracheal view and the esophageal view in a patient with a delayed congenital tracheosophageal fistula. So when the, when the RTF is confirmed, we, we perform the, the procedure. So, so while, uh, when you perform this kind of the procedure, of course you, have, uh, you need to, to, to have uh, the, the, the skills to perform the endoscopy. When I was in France, we were with uh, our otorhinolaryngologist, but in, in my hospital, actually in Barcelona, all my team have the, the skill to perform the, the, the endoscopy. And, and then today is uh, the pediatric surgeon who perform this kind of the procedure. So most of the time we use our, the rigid bronchoscope, 2.5 millimeter, the force, the cotton, and 50% TCA. So this is the technical detail for avoid any complication. So one of the complications is that the, the cotton can to fall down to the distal airway. And for avoid that, you need to place one of the stitches in order to avoid this kind of the complication and to mandate to maintain uh, the cotton under control. So while well, this is the, 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 the technique, so when you perform the technique, you, you perform it with two surgeons. One to perform the procedure and to expose the fistula under rigid bronchoscope. So the fistula is identified, the bronchoscope is support in the posterior wall of the trachea, and the fistula is exposed and endoscope is placed just in front in front to the fistula. So when you uh, start the, the experience, I, I propose that you perform the first procedure without TCA in order just to get the skills to perform the procedure when, when, when the, the, the skill was get, and then you perform the procedure, you small the, the cotton, and you introduce to the same channel the, the faucet, and to perform the procedure that you can see. So you need to be a little bit aggressive and to, to brush the fistula around 30 seconds, and the procedure is repeat three times during the same procedure. So the majority of the patient is living the same date. So look at this. This is another patient with RTEF. We perform the, the rigid bronchoscopy. You identify very well the fistula and you perform the, the chemocautotarization using the TC8. You, you, let me to show how when they finish the procedure, that the, the all airway is, is clean. So we, we work really on, on, the, on the fistula. This is when the, the procedure. This is the aspect of the airway that look at the aspect after chemocatheterization of the fistula, but the, the rest of the airway is clean. So, of course, you can to associate that additional procedure because I said when you associate an additional procedure, you have a more more rate of the successful. So after finish of the chemocatheterization of the TCA, you can use the brush. It's the same brush that you use for cleaning the endoscope. Uh, this is another case that look at the esophagogram. You identify very well the fistula. That look at the aspect of the fistula is very large. You perform the procedure, as uh, so been explained, uh, under the fistula. I look at this. Uh, in this, this is the same patient two months after the procedure, and even the we perform the esophagogram that we don't, we don't they, they are not the fistula, the patient is asymptomatic and the, the control, the bronchoscopy is, uh, is uh, the fistula is closed. So these are the very nice uh, results. So actually uh, we perform the, the same treatment, treatment for, for the tracheal pouch in patient with uh, every note that they, in a few cases, the tracheal 
pausure can be can be uh, symptomatic with pulmonary infection. Um, we we perform and of course the esophagogramma where they are not connection with the esophagus. The look at the CT scan, the aspect of yeah, the pulse. And in this case, we perform an also the procedure. The look at this, the aspect of the airway with several, some degree of the malaysia with mucopurulental separation. The look at this, the, the localization of the, of the pulse at level to the carina. But also in this case, we perform the, the procedure with the TCA. But, uh, on the right side is the same patient that look at the, the aspect of the airway is very clean. The patient is asymptomatic and the pouch is closed. So this is, this is we have for several cases with the, with the, this, with this kind of the, of the, of the symptom. So this is our, our experience, 40 patients that, that today in, in Barcelona, of course, the endoscopic treatment is our first line of the treatment for RTF. At that time, we report four patients, 12 RTF, and two delay of uh, congenital tracheosocal fistula. And in 100%, we have the, the success. Rate. So this is the, the data of the patients, or in all, in all patients, the fistula was closed. From the beginning, we, we used uh, three applications, but Today is uh, patient by patient. So only two complications, one pneumonia require the IV antibiotic, one bronchospasm. Uh, and then in conclusion, the endoscopy here using the 50% TCA is attractive, effective site with the low morbidity. And today is uh, become uh, for us our first line of the treatment of the RTF. So thank you so much, and I uh, wish you a happy Easter for, for all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Manuel. This was an awesome talk, and I have already a lot of questions, um, and there are um, many in the chat, um, because we also um, checked out this technique. But before we come to the discussion, um, I will introduce the second speaker and then we discuss everything together, uh, what appears up in the chat uh, and um, hopefully have a good discussion. So um, the second speaker of tonight is Professor Darius Patkowski. He is a specialist um, also in pediatric surgery and pediatric urology. Um, he is head of department of pediatric surgery and urology at Wroclaw Medical University in Poland and he is past president of the Polish Society of Pediatric Surgeons. His main interest is um, pediatric endoscopic surgery, especially in the newborns. And he has given more than 100 lectures about endoscopic surgery at national and international meetings and courses. So Darius um, has one of the greatest experience worldwide with a thoracoscopic repair of especially long gap esophageal atresia with more than 150 um, cases. In fact, he has done one case today, which he just uh, shared with us. And he's especially um, an expert in making these um, sliding knots in a very meticulous technique. Um, that's why some people call him the, the Michael Jordan of Peter Dick um, endoscopic suturing. That's what we always um, say. Um, but he's not only a great surgeon, he has become uh, like Manuel, um, uh, a great friend over the years. Um, and Darius, um, it's also both uh, a great pleasure and honor for us to have you with us tonight and uh, to share your experience um, in how you handled recurrent uh, tracheoesophageal fistula. So please. Martin, thank you very much for the nice introduction. We are friends for many, many years. So we meet very frequently in different occasions. And thank you very much for your invitation. <clears throat> uh, so of course, talking after Manuel is a little bit difficult with, because his technique is really uh, fantastic. Manuel also operated, did the same operation at our department four or five years ago with excellent results. So. I will talk about thoracoscopic 
the repair of tracheoesophageal fistula. And uh, as already Manuel told us, it's most often after complicated esophageal tracheal repair, the fre frequent fistula is different. If you look at the literature, it's between two or even up to 16 percent. And even after open or endoscopic repair, the risk for uh, recanalization is more than 20 percent. So it's always a challenge. And if you look for the potential problems, if you think about potential problems, so as usually fistula is after anastomotic leakage, so uh, redo surgery is really a challenge because usually there is a lot of adhesions, there is a very long drainage of the pleura, so the access is uh, really very difficult because you have to go through the adhesions. And also the problem is that it's in not only our experience that the fistula is more to the uh, left uh, side of the trachea, uh, the same as the esophagus is more to the left of the trachea. So uh, it's really a challenge to get to the uh, to the to this uh, fistula. So. We have developed at our department a completely different technique, uh, left thoracoscopic approach that has potential advantages. Uh, first, the most probably important is the virgin operative field. Nobody was there before. So there is no postoperative adhesions in the left chest. We have more direct visualization of the pathological structure. And it may be as a second line of treatment when we failed with endoscopic closure, especially when the fistula is very long or very wide, and when hemocatheterization is not, is not working. Probably in manual hands, it works almost always. So just I show you our case, and then we will discuss later uh, the, uh, how to manage uh, such uh, patients. So uh, this is just a case presentation, female newborn that was operated uh, because of esophageal atresia with distal uh, TEF. It, she was operated by thoracoscopic approach. However, there was a very long time postoperative leakage, almost one month very long time hospitalization, recurrent esophageal stenosis, uh, long-term uh, TPN, and also recurrent pneumonia. So when you look at the chest, uh, at the CT scan of the chest, you can see on the right chest, a lot of inflammation, probably fibrosis in the uh, lung. And you can see that to the left side, of the uh, esophagus, there is something like a canal that is a remnant of tracheoesophageal fistula, fistula, and also this is a recurrent fistula. So when you look to the, to the bronchoscopy, you can see that there is a white channel uh, on the posterior the wall of the trachea, you can see also some tracheomalacia here. Uh, you can put a drain even in, into it. It's a very long. However, we couldn't pass uh, through it into the esophagus. When we checked it from usually, when you look from the esophagus for recurrent fistula, uh, it's not very easy to find the, the canal, <clears throat> like in this case, you can see the site of anastomosis with some degree of stenosis, but you cannot see any channel. But when we did an X-ray study like this, you can see that there is the fistula somewhere here at the level of the stenosis. 
you can see a contrast in the in the check here. So this was a, a really challenge for us how to manage uh, this uh, baby. Uh, she was uh, six months of age when uh, she arrived to our department. So we can see a lot of inflammation, fibrosis in the right chest. You can see the esophagus, you can see this canal of the fistula. You can see that it goes almost to the bifurcation. <clears throat> you can see even the clip here. So we decided to go through the left chest as there is potentially no potential no adhesions. But of course, the problem is the aorta coming there. But as the diverticulum or this fistula is on the left side of the trachea and the esophagus, so potentially it would be much easier to get there than going through the right chest through these adhesions and uh, divide all this structure. So this is how the baby was positioned on the operative table. This is the usual position that we use also for thoracoscopic esophageal chest repair, or of course, usually on the right side. But recently we had a case with the uh, right lung uh, agenesis, so we had to repair it from the left chest. So we can see completely prone position <clears throat> just at the border of the table. It's very important because it, uh, it facil facilitates uh, easy movement of instruments up and down. So usually the position of the instrument, the landmark is the scapula. So we put the instrument around the scapula. And this is just a short video you can see. So we start with the hook, but recently even we did the last case we did without any without any uh, electrosurgery that we also not use for esophageal chest repair. It's not necessary, but here it was, you, you can see that dissection is very easy because there is no adhesions almost. The only problem were segmental vessels coming from the aorta to the vertebra, but step by step, we could dissect and find the channel. You can see even the air going through the channel. It was very thick, but easy to repair. This is our observation that after thoracoscopic repair, we sometimes, when we do a bronchoscopy later, we can find a pocket or just a kind of diverticulum from the posterior wall of the trachea. And in this case, you can see that the channel is really very, very long. It doesn't mean that we left because it was uh, operated by us at another one hospital. It doesn't mean that we left such a long uh, channel. Probably there is some spontaneous growth of the channel. So you can see that on the trachea side, we put a clip across because it was really very difficult to suture it. We cut it partially and then put another one clip. So this is on the trachea side. And at the moment you will see that it's already cut off from the trachea. Look for how it's thick and how it is wide. And it goes directly to the esophagus. So at the end of this structure, you can see the esophagus. So here we put a suture around it. So this is this sliding knot that Martin told you, told you about it. So we put the round it around the fistula. And it was sutured and then cut off. We even just for safety, we put a, a clip across it, as you can see on the video. And then we cut it off. So you can see how long was the channel. So of course, it's not possible that we left it uh, during the primary operation, such a long one. 
it probably grew up spontaneously. So the even the postoperative uh, course was uneventful in this case. So we have, you can see, this is the diverticulum or the fistula tract. This is postoperative uh, scars. You can see on the left. Here you can see on the right side. So this is just contemporary surgeon's signature. So this is our experience with left thoracoscopic approach for recurrent uh, tracheoesophageal fistula. So we operated four cases. Two more cases were with long uh, trachea diverticula as uh, that was uh, a remnant of uh, the fistula. So until today, we had no conversion. Two cases were with hilar thorax. One required re thoracoscopy and it healed uh, without any problems. Until now, we had no recurrence. So all our patients are doing uh, well. So thank you very much for your attention. And just to our Ukrainian friends, I have a lot of friends in Ukraine. You are really strong and brave. You are together with you. You will win. And just to say Slava Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Darius, for the excellent talk. And I think the last, well, uh, the last address to our Ukrainian friends was, I think it's uh, from the bottom of our, all hearts. And that is very important in, in, in these times too. So we will come to the discussion. Um, the first question goes to Manuel uh, from Ronnie Sfire asking, um, how do you control the success of the procedure? Only from the tracheal side or do you scope the esophagus again? Do you do radiologic studies only clinically? What is your protocol? Okay, Th thank you, thank you Ronnie for your nice question. So, so well, from the, from the beginning, we performed systematic uh, evaluation uh, using the esophagogramma and endoscopic. So of course, the, you need to evaluate the clinical of the patient. So, so today, today uh, we are also, in, uh, when I arrived in Barcelona, we performed the same protocol. But this is today after after experience uh, is uh, we perform the evaluation depending of the uh, in in symptomatic patients. That's it. Okay, thank you. The second question comes from Angelo Lockhart. I I don't know whether I pronounced that correctly. Uh, how many times do you try to close the fistula if the first time was not successful? Okay, so once again, from, from, the, from the beginning, we perform systematically three application in these patients. So every monthly until completed closure was achieved. But sometimes our, uh, our feeling today is sometimes when, when, when you perform only one, one application, the patient was asymptomatic and when we, Perform and the, the evaluation under endoscopic or of the of the or esophagogramma, the fistula was closed. So it's for that that today I don't perform an, uh, a systematic the 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 three times, but is 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 case by case. Okay, and um... then, excuse me, just just for one comment more. I have a very good friends who use uh, this kind of the procedure, but. He, he has her one patient that he performed seven applications. But I mean, um, seven applications and no rethoracotomy is better than a rethoracotomy with, again, an esophageal stenosis and seven dilatations, right? So yeah. I think it's still a, you can still consider it a success if you succeed after seven times. But may I ask you this, this question, Manuel, they, maybe if you're not successful, they still cough a lot. 
So do you get like pneumonias when you send them home and then they come back in a very bad condition and then you need to wait until the next session? Have you experienced that also? So, so well, we have our, our, in the majority of our cases, the patient had, of course, before the treatment, the history of the recurrence and pneumonia with cough. So sometimes after the first application, the patient reduce is less symptomatic. So you need to treat the, the, you need to give a prophylactic antibiotic for until the second procedure. Okay, so okay. prophylactic antibiotics, that's an important point, right? So on, on one, one more details, uh, after the first complication of bronchospasmo, so for all patients, we propose or the corticoid, corticosteroids during 42 uh, days. Okay, so antibiotics until the next procedure and steroids uh, for two days. That's a good point. And that leads me to the next question from the chat. Basam Al-Abasi is asking, is there a risk of respiratory distress secondary to edema, especially in infants um, where the trachea is very small? So, well, it's for that you need to take in consideration every detail that we explain in order to avoid the spread of the TCA. I am totally agree that the size of the trachea is too small, but you need to, when you perform an endoscopic treatment, you need to take in consideration every detail and to perform the chemiocotutorization just when you find, when you identify perfectly uh, the fistula. Okay. So that also leads me to, to one question of mine. We, we had a case where, where we spilled a little bit the um, tree chlor acid and then the vocal cords got a little like whitish color only at, at the very margin on re-endoscopy was fine again. So did you have any spillage with effects on the vocal cord? So no, on the vocal cord, no. So, so when, the, when the fistula is too close to the vocal cord, it's, 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 it's very dangerous for risk of the high risk of the injury yeah. of the vocal cord. Yeah. Okay, good. So Darius, there's greetings, a lot of greetings from Ukraine for you. Um, and then there's a question. What is your follow-up, Darius, in your series? Do you have a migration of the clips? I saw so, you uh, use two metal clips. Okay. Okay. It was a time that we used uh, clips for uh, fistula closure when we repair esophageal atresia. Right now, we make a suture around the fistula. We don't use clips as it really migrate. If you do an X-ray later uh, during follow-up, you can find that there is no clip on the X-ray. And even we have, uh, we have a one case uh, that mother came with a boy to our department when he was three year or four years old. And she brought a clip in her hands because the boy suddenly started to cough and he ex-coughed the clip. I, I cannot imagine how it migrated into the trachea but it really happened. So the clips migrate. It's a real a reality. So we stop to use clips. Right now we just make suture. Also for uh, recurrent turf repair. Of course, if you have a difficulty to make a suture because the space is very small, so you have to put clips because it's the easiest way to do it. Good, um, yeah. I, I can only echo that we also had clip migration of the hemolock clip even, and I shared that case with, with you also, which was then in the right main bronchus uh, on follow-up. And there's a question for you, Darius, on the chylothorax. How do you treat that? Is that thoracoscopic treatment also, or what do you do? Yeah, we have uh, a few cases with chylothorax not only because of recurrent TEF, but also after esophageal atresia repair. And uh, even spontaneous chylothorac. And in such a case, we try to find the place, but it's not easy. It's not easy to see where the hylos is coming from. But in, in a case of uh, recurrent TEF repair, we just 
look at the place that we were with our instruments. And if we can see anything that uh, is similar to, uh, to the high, leak, high loss duct, then we put a clip here or just coagulate it. There is nothing more to do about it. Or just we use a spray coagulation for the uh, surface of the pleura. This is what you can do. Okay. And there's a question for you both. I don't know who wants to answer. Any opinion regarding posterior tracheopaxy? for a recurrent uh, TF? I have no experience with posterior <laughs> tracheopexy. So Mara? I don't do it. I am always prepared to do it. It's an excellent idea. Idea. I like it very much. But until today, I, I didn't have to do it. Because if you do, the, of course, it's much. I, I, to, I, I talked to David van der Zee who has great uh, experience uh, to do this uh, posterior tracheopexy. And he is right that it's much easier to do it with, when you do primary operation. But until now, I, I didn't have to do it. Okay. Manuel, any other thoughts on that? Otherwise we go to the next question. For which question? Posterior tracheopexy. No, I don't have any experience with posterior tracheopexy, but but for, I, I think that that yes, when you perform an, the procedure by tracheoscopic, it's really it's really easy to place one or two uh, stitches to fix the the the, the trachea to the posterior wall. But my question is, we need to do it systematically for all patients, but probably because the incidence of the surgical corruption of the tracheomalacia is very few. I don't think so that we need to do their systematic uh, tra posterior tracheoplexia at the moment of the first corruption. But, but I don't know, maybe we need to, to look in for how to, we can to evaluate at the moment of the procedure, the degree of the Malaysia. I don't know. Okay, great. Maybe um, we need to explore that. That's a question on transtracheal TF closure as a last opportunity. Any experience with that? Transtracheal? So you can do it. Yeah, we, we have, so not, we have uh, one, one patient, one adult patient with history of the multiple uh, surgical procedure for RTF. Um, this patient would like to come here to, to use the TCA. So we performed one section with TCA, the patient, the clinical patient improved. But however, the fistula is still open under, under CT control. But it was at the moment of the COVID uh, restriction. And then um, this patient was in London. And then they, the, the patient visit one of thoracic uh, surgeons who decide to perform the tracheal reception and, and to close the fistula. This is my, my, only, my only comment for that. So I would like to do an, another comment, but it was my recently experience with the, in, in the case that I show in, in, in one of uh, my slides, the patient with pulmonary esophageal uh, at, at RTF. So you know that the, with the last platform uh, using the ICG or IRIS, so I use for my light cases the IRIS, the infrared uh, illumination system. We place the, the guide. You can place the guide from, to the, from the esophagus to the trachea or from the trachea to the esophagus. And, and you can to identify during, even in, because this patient, have uh, multiple uh, or, or thoracotomias and, and using this system, uh, we can, by thoracoscopy, we can to identify after dissection, uh, after liberate the different ad ad addition, we can to, it was easy to identify to fistula and to dissect. It's like a, like a GPS, you, the, the, you, you see very well the, the, the fistula with the use of the infrared illumination system as you close the fistula. So this is the, the good, good uh, technical details. 
But of course, when you see uh, Darius Patkowski to perform and this kind of the procedure look like easy, but I promise it's not easy. But you see. I, I, I could um, picture that, yeah. It looks very easy. Also, Darius, a question. You went far to the right side going from the left. Have you ever experienced a pneumothorax on the left, which then with a capnothorax will create some trouble collapsing both lungs? Mm. Uh, today I did uh, esophageal chest repair with distal top, and I suddenly I opened the left pleura, so it was bilateral pneumothorax, but it was uneventful. We completed it without any problem. And just mm -hmm. at the end, we just get uh, the gas out and mm -hmm. lift the chest without any drainage even. It's okay. not necessary because you use CO2, so it will absorb very quickly. So it's not a problem. Great. There's a question from Manuel. Do you, um, when you do the acid application, would this, in case this fails, complicate further surgery? You know, there's the discussion that any further surgery after any endoscopic intervention will then make the tissue so fragile that any open surgery no. is a catastrophe? No. Okay, good. Um, how you check? I think we answered that already. Um, worsening of dysphagia after TCA procedure. Manuel, has, have you experienced worsening uh, of dysphagia? After, after TCA? Yes. The airway approach? No. Okay. Would anybody of you consider anti reflux surgery? for the treatment of TF? That's one question. I don't think that it is that recurrent uh, fistula is because of a reflux. Of course, it, it may be an additional factor. So I don't think that if the baby, if the patient is asymptomatic, if, if the patient has no reflux, yeah. usually I prefer any conservative treatment, not operative surgery. Okay. And there is another question for you, Darius. Um, if you got a second recurrence of the left-sided thoracoscopic repair, from which side would you approach that? From the left or the right, right side? Uh, as I mentioned, usually the recurrent fistula is after complicated esophageal chest repair. So usually the right chest is very difficult to access. So I would prefer to go through the left chest because even if I have a recurrence of uh, fistula, the pleura is usually clean. And we have a lot of cases that we had to do a red thoracoscopy after uh, other thoracoscopic procedures. And if the, the previous were uneventful, it's really easy. It's almost no adhesion in the pleura. So it's much easier to go through the left. I, I, I would recommend to go through the left chest. So right. even when you perform it by thoracoscopic, the yeah. primary reconstruction? Yeah, yeah, yeah because you know, it's, it, it, I would like to, you know, it, 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 maybe I misunderstand the question. Uh, would I do it open? No, I would like to do it. Oh, go from which side would you go? That is that is the question. Through the left, through the left, through the left again. Okay, great. You know, thoracoscopy gives you such a great visualization of the mediastinum. You couldn't get uh, the same picture through the open procedure. So I always try to do it by thoracoscopy. Okay. Any procedure. Good. And then there's also the question, but I think Mario, uh, um, Manuel, you showed a, um, a video on that. The question is from Dr. Bassam Alabazi about cauterization from the esophagus. But I, I think you, you showed the, the, the video and said it was successful. Do, did I correct that? Do I recall that cor correctly? So, no, I, I explained that, that in one of uh, uh, our videos uh, uh, present one patient with pulmonary esophagus fistula. That I, I say that uh, in this kind of the fistulas, you cannot to perform the endoscopic treatment through the, through the trachea because you don't see very well the hole. You suppose where is the location, but you don't see very well the cause. 
the whole, uh, the orifice. And the successful is when you perform and um, um, perfect, uh, when you see very well the fistula and you perform an um, perfect procedure. So in when you, uh, I have not experienced using the TCA through the esophagus, I, because or, when you perform this kind of the procedure, you use the rigid bronchoscope. So in through the esophagus, it's, it's easy to perform the flexible endoscopic approach. But in this case, we we can to offer the laser or one other systems. But when I explain the 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 this kind of the procedure has the high rate of for failure. And I, I think, Manuel, that you agree that the direction of the fistula is from the trachea up down to the esophagus. So it would be very difficult to make a any coagulation or catheterization from the esophagus because the direction of the fistula, yeah? Yeah, yeah. You, would, you would need like an ERCP kind of, yes. kind yeah. of style yeah. where you can go to the side. Retro right? A kind of retrograde. Yeah. So. Yeah. In this case, the, this case the, the pulmonary esophagus, we place through the esophagus and, and fiber, the mm -hmm. iris fiber. So mm -hmm. it's in this case that, that we use the, the iris, the infrared mm -hmm. illumination system during, during thoracoscopy in order to identify either the, the fistula and to close. Mm -hmm. Because the majority of these patients have, have been multiple surgeries and I uh, and I, of course, I am totally agree with Darius that they probably in their the, in their hands on, on the via left side it will be easier in patient with history of the multiple surgeries, of course. Okay, very nice uh, e equipment you have in Barcelona. All types of fibers, crazy stuff. I want to work right there. This seems to be like heaven now. Yeah? So, so maybe, maybe we I can to to share. Just one slide, is possible? Sure, sure, sure. We have uh, three more minutes. Okay, just, just to share this, or just one slide. Do you see on, on the screen? Yes. So look at this on the right side. This is the iris, this is the esophagus view that we play the, the fiber. Uh -huh. and look at it, we perform on the thoracoscopy. And, and at the same time, we perform an endoscopy to identify the fistula. And look at this on the inferior part on the left side. Yeah. You, you see the, the infrared, and you go straight after, of course, the dissection of the. Uh, you can to identify easier and to close with using the stapler, in, like in this case. And this case was a very nice, successful in, in this patient. Wow, thanks for sharing this. Looks looks great. Great. So I see no, oh, there's one final question. Had you tried to use endoscopic clips for these patient that doesn't close with the TCA? But I guess you just said um, they all closed. So mm -hmm. that's so why. Via, via, when you perform it, you perform it, uh, rigid bronchoscopy through the trachea. No, it's very dangerous to play the clip under the trachea. So maybe when you perform this procedure via esophagus, you can do it, but not through the trachea, no. Yeah, I also can picture, dislocate. Yeah. And... Yeah. Great, I see no more questions in the chat. So thank you everybody for this great session. I think this is the first time we finished by the hour because the two speakers, they were in time and uh, so punchy. And I, I like the discussion also a lot of interaction and we had a lot of uh, participants over 100 uh, uh, in the middle of the talk. So uh, thank you again very much, Manuel and Darius. Really, it was a great pleasure um, to, to do the session with you. I just want to share real quick my, um, the next webinar is on the May the 18th, also Wednesday at four o'clock. That's the UPSA webinar time on minimal invasive surgery for Wilms tumors. Um, there is um, Armando Lorenzo from Toronto and Thomas Blanc from Paris. And Thomas is doing robotics for Wilms tumor. 
Um, he's a true expert in Armando also. So I, I guess that's that's also um, a very nice webinar to to um, um, save in your di diaries. Okay. Uh, thank Gaia. We want to change Gaia. Gaia, can you say hello? The uh, social media queen, hello. <laughs> Yusa, who is uh, also um, always organizing these webinars together with Augusto Zani from Toronto and me. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to future endeavors. Gaia, anything else you want to add? No, I think all the information about our social was already written in the chat. Oh. So continue following us.